You're listening to a Frequency Podcast Network production in association with City News. It has not been easy around here the past few weeks. Obviously, elsewhere in the world, it has been much worse than that. This entire winter has been a string of fear and disaster. And you can go back two years saying that if you want to. But eventually, the sun comes back. The snow melts. Life begins to creep back in at the edges of the days. And you start looking for the good things that spring usually brings to us. And this year, maybe we are just a little more grateful for one of those things that we almost didn't get. Baseball indeed is back. Major League Baseball and the Players Association agreed to a new collective bargaining agreement. Opening day is scheduled for April the 7th. If you are a longtime listener of this show, then you knew this episode was coming. If you are new here, well, twice a year, this is a baseball podcast. A Blue Jays podcast, to be specific. And right now, there is perhaps no Canadian sports team better positioned to give this country something to celebrate. The baseball lockout ended just over a week ago. And uh, the Blue Jays have been busy. The Blue Jays may require some talent from Matt Chapman out of Oakland there. You say Kikuchi, three years, 36 million bucks, going north of the border. Exhibition baseball games start this weekend. The season is just three weeks away. It is almost 10 degrees above zero as I record this. And sometimes, some things are not so bad. What we did last year was uh, like a trailer. Now you guys want to see the movie. I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. This is The Big Story. Shai Davidi is the senior baseball columnist at Sportsnet. He is one of the reporters most closely connected to the Toronto Blue Jays. Hey, Shai. What's going on, Jordan? Not much. You're joining us live from spring training. I'm just picturing where you are and how nice it must be and how different this conversation with you that I'm about to have is from most of the ones we've been having lately. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I don't want to rub it in, but uh, this is uh, one of those classic spring moments today. Sky's blue. Morning mist has been burned off by the uh, by the warmth. It's quite nice. So I, I understand it's not the same back in Toronto. And so I apologize to the people back home. You're going to bring us uh, a little piece of it. And as we go all the way uh, into the formation of this team and and why people are so excited about this year, maybe first take us back to the end of last year. How good was this team, but how how short did they fall? I mean, they could literally not have come closer to making the postseason. They were one game out uh, they were in the best division in baseball. We, for the first time, you had four teams with at least 91 wins uh, in the same division. And the Blue Jays, you mean, consider everything they had to endure, starting the season at a, at a low A ballpark in Dunedin, moving to a triple A ballpark in Buffalo for finally getting to Toronto, a nomadic existence with all the stress that, that comes along with that. Uh, you know, that was obviously detrimental uh, over time, they were able to repair some roster issues that popped up early in the season, especially with their bullpen, stabilize that. And by the end of the season, they were a force. Yeah. You, you literally could not have come closer. So you had the emergence of Vladimir Guerrero Jr. into an MVP candidate. You had Bo Bichette take a significant step forward. Uh, Marcus Simeon, who departed as a free agent, uh, he had uh, a tremendous bounce back season. Uh, you had George Springer even fighting through injury delivering tremendous performance. They acquired Jose Barrios at the trade deadline and gave him a, another front of the rotation piece. Robbie Ray, who also left as a free agent, had a Cy Young season. Uh, he just had a, a tremendous group. And, you know, th- there are a lot of things to lament, a bit of a missed opportunity in, in some ways, uh, but also in, in some ways a significant achievement considering everything they had to go through. You're very plugged into uh, the management and the team and and what they're trying to do. What do you think Mark Shapiro and Ross Atkins took away from how close they came uh, when it was time to start uh, last year's offseason? Well, it was clearly time to push, right? That this team w- wasn't a one-off, right? It, this team shouldn't collapse. You know, baseball, of course, is is unpredictable, but 
you've got enough of a base of talent here to believe in what you have and that you needed to augment. And you know, this was something that they had envisioned, uh, something essentially that they had promised. And you know, it was tough for people to to see the bigger picture as they were tearing down the beloved teams of 15 and 16 and repositioning the franchise for a run like this. But they've got a tremendous platform. And so you saw that in their pursuit of players. You know, they tried to sign, re-sign Robbie Ray. And when that didn't work out, they, you know, essentially signed his right-handed equivalent in, in Kevin Gosman. You know, they extended Jose Barrios to be here as a, another anchor for that pitching staff. And then they kept on once the, once the lockout took place and was, was over. You know, they picked up right where they left off. They added uh, Yusei Kikuchi, who's going to be another piece of, of that starting rotation. They traded for Matt Chapman. Uh, you know, there, there's, there's still a few more moves I, I expect to come. So, you know, they, they really just continue to build on what they have and, you know, trying to turn this into as complete a ball club as they can. In a moment, I'm going to get you to break down uh, a few of those moves and, and a couple of these new players for fans. But first, you mentioned the lockout. Um, how tough was it? This was not a great time to have no baseball, considering everything um, fans have been going through. But, but even more so, just specifically the Blue Jays with the position that they're in, as you kind of mentioned, you know, right on the cusp, ready to build, ready to push, and to have the whole thing shut down uh, for almost 100 days. What was that like covering the team? But also, what were you hearing from inside the team uh, over that time? Well, I mean, in terms of covering it, you know, it's, uh, I think the only thing less fun than covering a lockout is covering uh, COVID in sports. Right. So uh, it's, it was about a dreary a period, as you can imagine. And there's just a lot of angry back and forth and a lot of posturing between the sides and a lot of using the media in different ways. It, it can be exhausting, uh, certainly for the people involved in it and you know, even for those of us who, who had to cover it. But I think we all understood why you know, the players felt, uh, you know, my, my sense justly so, that the economics of the sport had tilted uh, too far back towards the owners and with a lot of additional new revenue streams coming into the game. You know, they felt they needed to, you know, claw some of that back. And, and that was a significant part of this. You know, from the owner's side, it was mostly a, a defensive negotiation. There weren't a lot of things that they really needed in this. They wanted expanded playoffs. They got that. And beyond that, they were just sort of looking to keep their costs down as best they could. So there was a sense that both sides were willing to miss games, came very close to that. But they both pretty much waited till the the very last second they could uh and you know were able to strike a deal and i think both sides understood that if they were to sacrifice games it would be very damaging for the sport from from the blue jays perspective this was immensely frustrating mm-hmm. this is a year of opportunity for them right this is a year of ambition for them and you know having a shortened spring training uh, instead of being able to make all the moves that you, they wanted to pull off it, during the off season and having your group ready on day one of camp, you know they're still making transactions uh, a week into spring training. It's a very odd situation to have what's essentially the first week of December from a transaction standpoint occurring simultaneously as the first week of, of training camp. So that's been uh, you know a little bit head spinning for for everybody in, in a lot of ways. But there was a sense that they could get through this disruption and a lot of determination. You know, the Blue Jays players were very much staying on their programs so they could try to be as close as they would be uh, in mid-March uh, in a normal camp as uh, uh, this year when they arrived. And, you know, there's a sense that they're not uh, not that far behind because of a lot of the motivation here. So. Uh, certainly frustration, a lot of relief, uh, and that's given way to a lot of excitement about the uh, this, this season and the opportunity ahead. I promise we'll talk about the team on the field in just one second, but for fans or listeners who rightly so maybe uh, just completely tuned out the lockout and didn't want to hear uh, any of that stuff, can you just quickly explain the on-field changes that we'll notice maybe, like just what's going to be different as a result of the new collective bargaining agreement? Well, the first thing is that there'll be a universal DH, and that's something that both sides wanted, and was the logical uh, point of uh, point of progression. So, no more pitchers hitting in the National League. So that's that's definitely a big one. The sides have 
uh, will, will, or will create a competition committee, a joint competition committee to examine rule changes. The commissioner of baseball, Rob Manfred, there's been a change in terms of he only needs to provide 45 days of notice now instead of a year in terms of imposing rule changes. So hmm. how that plays out, whether we see rule changes this year, you know, we know that Major League Baseball would like to implement a pitch clock. We know that they would like to eliminate the shift. Uh, there's been discussion about moving towards uh, bigger bases, which would essentially shorten the time running between them that may create a little bit more activity on the field. So th- those, those, those elements are still under discussion. Uh, and another piece that fans will notice, obviously not this season, but next season beyond, is uh, the move towards a more balanced schedule. So it's been uh, very, very focused on divisional play. And in the coming years, every team is going to play each other at least once, uh, including the interleague teams. And we're going to see a little bit of a, a little bit less of an emphasis on divisional play. So, you know, for teams like the Blue Jays, that means uh, a little bit less Yankees, Red Sox uh, on your schedule. That's got to be good news uh, for the Jays, at least going forward. As you mentioned, uh, the AL East with four 90 win teams is pretty brutal. Yeah. And like uh, for, for me, I, I don't. You know, those games are usually entertaining, so I don't mind it. But uh, a little bit more variety is nice. Right. You know, I'd like to see more of the other teams and more of the other players. You know, if you're if you're a Blue Jay fan, you know, generally they're only playing six games against the, the Angels each season. That's just two opportunities to watch Mike Trout, Shohei Otani, two of the most dynamic players in the game. Uh, so it's going to be nice to be able to see all the teams a little bit more often. Uh, in person. And I think for for fans, that variety will be a nice element. Now let's talk about what we will see uh, in the next few weeks and hopefully months. And maybe we'll start uh, with the rotation. You mentioned that they replaced Robbie Ray with Kevin Gossman, extended Jose Barrios, and now have signed uh, Yusei Kikuchi. Maybe just walk us through this rotation and, and how does it stack up against the rest of the league? Yeah, I mean, it's got a chance to be one of the best in baseball. You know, on paper, it certainly fits that billing. And, you know, that depth of starting is a total weapon because not a lot of teams have that. And when you're stable and you're getting a lot of consistent innings uh, in that fashion, then that's a good building block. It puts less of an emphasis and less pressure on your bullpen. And so, you know, that really is going to be the the springboard for the Blue Jays to their success. And you know, Barrios has been a front of the rotation starter for a very long time. He's also extremely durable, as is Kevin Gosman, two of the most durable pitchers in baseball. So, you know, the Blue Jays can uh, can feel pretty comfortable that they're going to be getting a lot of innings and aren't going to have to worry about the health uh, of those two players. You know, Hyunjin Ryu comes back and he doesn't have to carry the load the way that he had to do in 2020 at the beginning of 2021. So Mm -hmm. if he's not as good as he was in the past, but it's a bit above average, you know, that's all the Blue Jays need. Uh, Alec Manoa is the youngest member of that staff. He's going to coming back after a very impressive rookie season and has a chance to and the, the, the repertoire to continue growing. He's got, you know, a couple dominant fastballs. He's got a slider that's an absolute weapon. Then Yusei Kikuchi is uh, a bit of a wild card. You know, he came over from Japan three years ago, had had very high expectations because of his stuff, and things just kind of went sideways for him in Seattle. And he really underperformed his abilities in in some ways. Uh, So the Blue Jays have had some good success unlocking, you know, some pitchers with that type of backstory you know uh, you think about Robbie Ray as obviously the, the prime example but even with Steven Matz as well you know somebody who just not been performing to his abilities and you know with a few adjustments here and there uh, he was able to to reach some of his potential so uh, the Blue Jays are certainly hoping that the same thing happens with Kikuchi and you know he'll be closely watched but you know with all, with all those guys they don't need any of them to necessarily be a star they can just be solid across the board and in combination with the offense, that'll be plenty for this club. How good is the offense? Um, we talked about Vlad Guerrero and Bo Bichette, obviously Teoscar Hernandez still there. Marcus Simeon is not. Um, what does this lineup look like as it stands? And, you know, where are its strengths and and does it have weaknesses? Yeah, I mean, it's a monster. 
right? <laughs> There's no other way around it. <laughs> yes, it's a softball question. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's it's really as deep as any. I mean, certainly the the Dodgers with their pending addition of Freddie Freeman. You know, that's that's a pretty impressive lineup too. You know, the Yankees have some bangers in there as well. But you just think about some of the dynamism the Blue Jays have in in that lineup. You know, Bo Bichette can beat you in a number of different ways. Teoscar Hernandez can beat you in a number of different ways. George Springer can beat you in a number of different ways. Vladimir Guerrero Jr., I think, would be smart money to bet on MVP this year after the season he had. And, you know, I think what he accomplished last season, as impressive as it was, was a beginning rather than an end for him. So, you know, that group alone is is pretty remarkable. And then you think about adding Matt Chapman with, you know, his power and his on-base ability. You know, he doesn't have to hit for a ton of average. He doesn't have to be a guy. But, you know, he was in the marine layer sinkhole of Oakland for his career and, you know, the cavernous ballparks of the American League West primarily and still put up big numbers. And now he's going to come into the American League East band boxes in a, in a slugging lineup. You know, that's uh, that's going to play up. You know, Lourdes Gurriel Jr. remains uh, a really intriguing offensive player. Danny Jansen, the catcher, you know, he's he's hit at every level and was maybe found himself a little bit as a hitter. Uh, he struggled for the most part in his big league career, but there is more ability there. So there's reason to believe he can be a contributor too. I left defense till last because uh, it's kind of the least sexy of the three aspects of the game, but it got a little more sexy with the acquisition of Matt Chapman. Maybe explain for fans who who haven't seen him because he usually plays late on the West Coast and don't have a lot of experience with him. Who is this guy and uh, and how does he change what the Blue Jays can do in the infield? Sure. So, you know, Matt Chapman is one of the best defenders in baseball, regardless of position and you know, depending how, how you want to split hairs, he's either the best third baseman in the game or he's right there alongside Nolan Arenado, Manny Machado. What he does is he stabilizes a position that was a bit of a sore point for the Blue Jays last year. And he's so good that he makes other players better. So I'm going to try to simplify a little bit of nerd stat here to demonstrate so sort of one element of impact So there's a measure called outs above average, which gauges how many times you make outs that other players aren't getting to. And you can break that down to the direction that they move. And so we'll look at outs above average to the left side, uh, which at third base, you're obviously going to be primarily concerned about how good you are to the left, Mm -hmm. because to the right, it's foul territory. And the, the Blue Jays collectively last year were a negative three. So they were three outs below average, uh, moving to the left side and out uh, at third base. Chapman by himself was a plus five. So that in itself is an eight out swing. And having him there allows the Blue Jays to do a lot of different things positionally. And it also takes a ton of pressure off Bo Bichette, who at times would have to cheat to his right at shortstop uh, to compensate for some of those shortcomings. And now he doesn't have to do that anymore. And he can maybe cheat to his left and then tighten up the, the hole up the middle. So, you know, it, that's just one example. But it, it comes across on plays, uh, you know, on everything from how he charges balls, uh, you know, being able to, to get to bunts, being able to get to balls in foul territory, being able to make more consistent throws across to both second and first base on plays. So, so outs aren't lost in that way. You know, the the entire package has a chance to be extremely impactful. Uh, And even if he's a below average hitter, which he won't be, he will be a, a massive difference maker for this team because of his defense. So last question then, given all of this, um, which again, is so much nicer than the questions I'm usually asking on this show. (laughs) What is the mood like down there? You mentioned it's a beautiful day. You know, you're talking to the guys, you're talking to uh, management. What are the expectations? What's the vibe? Uh, It's just a lot of excitement, right? Uh, Also, just, you know, sort of get to work. There is a sense of needing to make up a bit for lost time because of the lockout. But I mean, this group is very confident. Right. And there's, uh, you know, pick your cliches, there's unfinished business or, you know, wanting to make up for what happened last year or, you know, getting uh, getting a little vengeance, feeling uh, feeling that 
things went against them in, in a number of different ways and they didn't get a chance to compete in the playoffs when they deserve to. But like this group is immensely confident in itself and they should be because they're I- incredibly deep, but they, they want to get after it. They want to get there after last season. And so, you know, you definitely feel that energy. There's a bit of expectation. Uh, there's a lot of depth too. There's a lot of talent beyond the big league level, which helps uh, as well because, you know, these guys know that if there are the inevitable injuries hit and things of that nature is that, that they have the bodies to, to compensate for it. So it's really exciting here. Uh, be, and it hasn't been this way in, in quite a long time. You know, they, they're obviously feeling a little bit more relaxed knowing that they're going to open the season in Toronto after having, uh, you know, a lot of chaos around their home the past two years. So in, in a lot of ways, the, the, the calendar can't move fast enough to get to opening day and, and get after it. Uh, but, you know, everybody understands, too, that, you know, they need these three weeks of spring training and to make sure that they get themselves as ready as they can be. Shai, thank you so much for this. Go enjoy the sunshine and we will see you at the ballpark for a full season of Blue Jays home games. Fingers crossed. Yeah, it sounds good. Looking forward to it. Shai Davidi of Sportsnet. That was the big story. I love to end the week on a note like that. You can find us at thebigstorypodcast.ca. Find us on Twitter at TheBigStoryFPN. If you really want baseball tweets, you can follow me on Twitter at TheGameSheet. You can also talk to us via email, thebigstorypodcast, that is all one word, at rci.rogers.com. And you can find this podcast in any podcast player that you like. You can even ask for it on a smart speaker by saying, play The Big Story Podcast. Today... I would like to end this podcast with a shout out to The Big Story's original lead producer, Claire Broussard. Claire and I began this podcast with a little help from Stephanie almost four years ago. We wouldn't be here without her, and as she moves on to another opportunity, we want to thank her and wish her all the best. Thanks for listening. I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. Have a great weekend. Steph and I, and Joe, and Braden and Efwa will be back Monday.